Hi, good morning. Welcome, everyone. Uh, today, we're going to talk about angular momentum. Um, that's Lawrence preparing for the lecture. Uh, and so I'm happy to say that the lecture today is going to be conceptually interesting. And we shove most of the most annoying calculations to the tutorial. Uh, so this will be uh, Lydia's problem, not mine. And uh, I think it's quite fun because we'll see how many things come together that we've been talking about in the last few weeks. So we'll talk about angular momentum, we'll justify everything. Um, but just to give you an overview of what we'll do today is we'll talk about the classical angular momentum, what it means, when it is, is it useful? Then we'll define the quantum angular momentum. We'll see that it has some operators that satisfy the same commutation relations as spin, which means that then we can apply all this spin machinery. Then we'll see at some point that uh, it's no good to work with X, Y, Z coordinates uh, because the cases where this is useful are cases of spherical symmetry. So we need to swap to spherical coordinates, but we've not done any uh, change of coordinates in the quantum case. So there's a bit more subtlety here that we'll have to go into. And then finally, we will apply all these things together to try to find what the eigenstates of the angular momentum in the z direction are. And then next lecture, this will all be very useful to, to talk about the hydrogen atom and what stage the electron is when it's like orbiting the proton in the hydrogen atom. Okay. So that's kind of the plan. As always, uh, you can unmute yourself to ask questions or you can ask in the chat, I'm, I can see you here. Let me just like this so that your faces are not on YouTube. Good. Okay, so what is angular momentum classically? So you probably talked about it in high school physics, if you haven't had any physics since, since you started uh, university. So it was defined as uh, this product here, which we'll talk about. So this is the cross product. of the position of something, of some system, a particle or a, a mass, a ball, whatever, and the, the momentum. So of course it will depend on the velocity of the thing, on the mass, because it is all inside the momentum, and then it depends on the position. And of course the position is always with respect to some point, right? I don't say my position is three meters, it's three meters from the door, for example. Uh, and so it's going to be all about how we choose like the center of this uh, of our coordinate axis, which will tell us whether this this quantity is relevant or not. So to give you maybe an example, when we have say a star, say the sun, and we have around the sun uh, maybe a planet, Earth is moving and is moving with some momentum p. And then the position relative to the to the star is r. And then what this what this angular momentum does, what the cross product does, is it returns a vector as well, and it works like this. So if the position is uh, x, y, z, so it's a vector classically. There's no Hilbert spaces yet, and the momentum is um, what well, momentum in the x direction, in the y direction in the z direction, then what this does is to give us a new vector which has the following coordinates. So it's y p z minus z p y in the x direction. And here goes z p x minus x p z in the y direction and x p y minus y x in that direction. So this is what we call say Lx, Ly, Lz. Yeah. So in this case, maybe you've learned to use the, like the right hand rule. So position goes like this, momentum goes like this. So the, yes, so the angular momentum comes directly to me. I'll draw it here. So it, it's something coming out of the sheet of paper. Okay, it's a vector. We don't worry about it. Uh, why is it important? The thing is, in many problems where we have some kind of spherical symmetry, like here, 
So we have the gravitational force, which is pulling, is pulling the Earth towards the sun and vice versa. And in kind of problems like this, you have conservation of, of angular momentum. When we define the angular momentum with, the, with like the center of the coordinates being like this, the center of symmetry. So this is the kind of thing we probably heard about, like if you have uh, someone doing ice skating and they, if, they, if they're spinning and they open their hands, then they slow down because the angular momentum is conserved, but now the position of my hands relative to the center is larger. So the, the velocity needs to, to decrease. It's this kind of, of things that appear a lot. You can explain lots of phenomena in classical physics with it. Uh, why do we care about it in the quantum case? Well, because we're gonna have the case where we have atoms, where there's some kind of nucleus, maybe with protons and uh, neutrons. And then around it, there will be electrons. And these electrons are particles, so they have some momentum associated. So it looks like uh, a very similar problem to that, right? It looks like a problem where if we define some quantum equivalent of the angular momentum, it might be conserved which means that then it's, it's a quantity of interest, right? And this will be exactly what we'll do. We'll not prove this today, but tomorrow we'll, we're going to look at the, the Hamiltonian of the hydrogen atom, and we're going to see that it, it does commute uh, with the quantum version of angular momentum. This would mean then that uh, your eigenstates of angular momentum are gonna be your energy eigenstates, so they are stationary states. So if you, if you want to know how the hydrogen atom works at um, when it's very cold, so in, in the ground state, for example, then you have to look at the angular momentum eigenstates. Uh, so that's uh, the overall motivation. Uh, so now we have to define this in the quantum case. Uh, and now, I mean, we, we don't define these vectors right away like this. What we do is say, okay, quantum. Angular momentum. Well, what's our Hilbert space overall? It's our 3D Hilbert space, right? Which is HX, HY, tensor product, which HZ. Right? So now we will define these things just like uh, just like before, I'll just copy and paste them here. Uh, let's get this thing there. Uh, maybe in a different color. It's not very readable. So, okay. Now yeah, this is the same as the other, sorry. <laughs> So we define, we're going to define again, kind of in direct analogy here, we define the LX like this, but except that now Y and Z and PZ and PY act in different Hilbert spaces. So we, we respect this. So we define LX. It's going to be this YPZ. What is this? So this is identity on X tensor, the Y operator in the Y space tensor the pz the momentum in the in the z space minus now the other way around took z here in the z okay, so if you missed continuous systems no it's time to get it back so this is px Identity on y times z on the z system minus the other way around. So x on the x system, uh, sorry, identity in the y and z. And we do the last one by hand. So x py. So these are all operators that act on this 3D Hilbert space, which is the tensor product of each uh, direction. So P 
Px, Y, I did it yet. <coughs> so now, what's my claim? The claim is that these operators, these three operators that I defined here, satisfy the commutation relation. So this is I H bar L Z L Y L Z. It's going to be I H bar L X and L X L Y is going to be I H bar. Uh, sorry. Well, I've done that before, so this is L Z L X. So these are exactly the commutation relations for spin. So if you can do this, then we can apply all the spin machinery to find all the eigenstates and so on, right? Um, if this is true, then we can define L squared, L plus, L minus, and so on from here from these operators, even without looking at their explicit forms in terms of X and P. So we're gonna prove this now first, and then we move on. Uh, and we're gonna prove for the first one, and then the other two are exactly the same. So let's do it. Proof. So LX, LY. Uh, Okay, so you can do it extensively. So you can really write, you can write uh, all of them and compute all the commutators by hand. I found a kind of a, a trick. So let's just copy this too. So let's put this here. This is equal to the commutator between these two operators, right? This and this one. Oh, doesn't even fit. Okay. So it's the commutator between the, the operator on top and the operator at the bottom, right? I'm going to give them names. So I call this thing here A. B, C, and D. Okay. So first ingredient is that when we have A, the commutator is linear. So when you have A, B, C, D, you have all these four different terms, which are their own uh, things. So uh, sorry, let me write here AD. AD plus BC plus uh, BD. Okay. Now, out of these, two of them are going to be zero right away because if you look at this, uh, so let's look at what was it? A and D. So this commutator here. So that's the commutator of this operator and this operator. Okay. So we can look at it uh, subsystem for subsystem. So on the first subsystem, we have identity and X, this commute. On the second subsystem, we have Y and the identity, this commute. On the third sus subsystem, we have PZ and PZ, an operator always commutes with itself. So then this term is zero. So this one is zero. Uh, and we have the same, uh, in this case, B and C, so that's these two operators. So we can look at it again. So identity and PX commute. PX and identity, PY and identity commute. Z and Z, it's the same operator, so they also commute. Yep. So, okay, so now we have AC and BD. And now we, what we use is this other trick, uh, which I'll write up here. <laughs> And then if you know, if you have, question? yeah, question, yes. I just want to ask uh, the C, is this, a, is this is the C, between the C and the D, is this a dot or is this a, or is this a comma? 
oh, this should be a dot, this should be, yeah, nothing. So it's just a multiplication. Uh, sorry, it should be a plus. Uh, sorry about that, it should be a plus here. Thank you very much. Yeah. Uh, okay. Yeah, so now you believe this. Good. So now we have, uh, we still have some commutators that are not zero. So, so this is this and this, right? And the nice thing is that they are trivial except in, a, in one subsystem of interest. So let me just write it like this. So if I have something like one tensor, an identity tensor, uh, since there's a matrix into another matrix, and then I have C tensor, the identity tensor, another matrix. <coughs> this is just C tensor A tensor, the commutator of the two B and D. So we did this explicitly for the simplest case where say we don't have the first subsystem, you just have this, right? We prove this explicitly in this case. Right, that if you just have an operator there and the rest took. So if you apply it twice, you get you get the total case. Right? You can do it by hand if you if you want. I do this because I don't want to write things all the time. So now let's look at what we have here in A and C. So in the first subsystem, we just have Px. So you can write here Px. In the sub subsystem. In the second subsystem, we just have y, y, and the identity on the other hand, right? And now what is left is this commutator of pz and z. Okay. So pz and z. And then we're left with that with the last one. So it's a plus because all the minus signs cancel out. Uh, where What we have, so we have X on the first subsystem. X on the first subsystem. Mm -hmm. Oop. Tensor. PY on the second subsystem. Uh, give me just a second. Okay, and then we're left with the commutator of what? So we have Z and PZ. Okay. Uh, okay, good. All right, good. And these commutators, we know what they are, right? Because we know that, for example, Z and PZ is I H bar identity in Z, right? This is the canonical commutation relation. We know it from before. Good, so then what we have is here, because it's here it's the other way around, so it gets a minus sign. Oh, and I'm sorry, this is a wrong sign here. It's good. Come on. Okay, so then we get minus i h bar px tensor y plus i h bar tensor identity in z x p y uh, sorry, tensor the identity in Z. Yeah. Good, but now what is this thing here? Well, this is just the definition of the of the angular momentum in the Z direction. So if you go back and see, I'll go back now. Right here, it is. X P I in the identity in Z minus P X Y in the identity in Z. So this whole thing now is I H bar LZ. And this is the first commutation relation. And then the other two are the same. So then so then we are we're on. So now we are in the spin system. We know that angular momentum in the quantum case behaves like spin. Great. I mean, it makes sense because spin was defined in analogy to angular momentum, not the other way around. So now we can define the operations that are missing. 
I'll stop writing in green because it's an annoying color. So L squared is LX squared plus LY squared plus LZ squared. So we never really work with these vectors. Like in the classical case, we can always work uh, with this. L plus the ladder operators, L plus and L minus are LX plus and minus respectively, I, L, Y. And this one is what we call the total angular momentum. And this is uh, what we call the raising and lowering operators, right? So now what we're looking for are the eigenstates as before, as in normal spin, joint eigenstates of L square and LZ because you know that they commute, right? So this will be of this form. Um, so L is what we called S for spin. Now in angular momentum, they call it L just because then when we have, you know, when we have composite systems that have the position and the position has some angular momentum and you have also internal spin like the electron, you don't want to confuse all the different S's, so give it a different L. So what does this mean? So L is associated with the total angular momentum with L squared, so with the usual um, eigenvalue, Lm. And M is associated with the spin, uh, sorry, with the direction Z of the angular momentum. So this is Hm, Lm. Okay, good. Uh, but now, Let's not forget where do these states live? Well, they live in 3D, right? So LM, this actually lives in HX tensor, HY tensor, HZ, which means it will have some wave function, right? If you want to compute the explicit form of these states, then we need to find the explicit wave function. So, Let's just write it down so that we have it here. And then we have here the wave function, um, which depends on x, y, z. And I put this indices Lm. And then here are the cats that live in this 3D space, right? So x. Uh, good, so then we are looking for, for these wave functions, right? And now what's the problem is that I, I can tell you now that uh, this kind of things, they will have spherical coordinate, uh, spherical symmetries, meaning they'll be of the form of, I don't know, uh, if I write here, uh, x, y, and z, they're gonna be of the form of, I don't know, depending only on R or depending on R and I don't know, some angle that they're, they're gonna be a bit thicker at the bottom and top and thing. So they have spherical coordinates. Now, uh, so they have spherical symmetries. If you try to write down a circle or the, yes, the equation for a circle in X and Z uh, directions is not too bad, but as soon as you get to something a bit more complicated, it gets it gets really cumbersome to work in this coordinates in x direction, right? For example, in spherical coordinates, um, what are spherical coordinates? So these are of this form. So here x, z, and uh, say y, for example. In to define a position here, we have R is the absolute value of the vector that gets us there. Theta is the angle with the Z axis. And um, and phi is kind of, is this, if you project it in the X, Y plane, then it's this angle here. So I should make it a bit more clear. So this is phi. Now, if you want to describe a sphere here, it's very simple. In, in this coordinate, it's just oh, R equals 
the radio of the sphere, and this is all the points, right? So it's all the points uh, theta phi such that this is this. If you want to describe it in terms of x, y, and z, it's a bit more complicated. And if you want to describe what we'll end up with, so this um, this uh, eigenstates of Lz and Lx and sorry and L squared in in the Cartesian coordinates, it's going to be impossible. Okay? Not impossible, but you know, not you're not going to end up with differential equations you want to solve. So we need to move to spherical coordinates. So let me just write exactly what the spherical coordinates are. Uh, so what is x? So r gives you the dimension of the vector. And then you have sine of theta and cosine of this, and that's your x. Y is r sine of theta, sine of phi, and z is r cosine of theta. And where do, where do r and the two angles live? So r can be anything from zero to plus infinity. Theta just goes up and down. So it's just the angle with the z axis. So it just goes between zero and pi, right? Where zero means it's here and pi means it's down there. And phi is between uh, zero and two pi. Okay, good. <clears throat> so we know how to transform from from the Cartesian coordinates to the spherical coordinates and vice versa in the classical case, but what happens in the quantum case, right? Because now we have these three Hilbert spaces, well, what, how do we transform from one to the other? And so maybe the, let's start with an analogy. And then I'll tell you what I mean by this. So the analogy is that there's many ways to slice a cake. Yeah, so if I have a, a nice cake, yeah, I'll make here another copy of the cake. So most people would, if asked to slice the cake, they would go and slice it in kind of, in this uh, slices starting from the center, right? Everyone gets a slice, everyone's happy. Right? But you could, of course, just go through the cake and just slice it like this with parallel lines in from the top. So you could just go chook, 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 chook. Yeah. Ended up with slices like this, right? Now, of course, each point in the cake is still in. in in this in these two different cuts, but it's not. Op I mean, you cannot just map one slice uh, on the left. This slice does not map exactly to a slice there. It maps to some kind of conjunction between the, uh, a cut of the different slices here. This to say, I have my beautiful Hilbert space in three D, right? which so far we've seen as taking hx, hy, hz, taking the tensor product and say, this is my global Hilbert space. But there's a different way to get the same space, cutting it like this, which would be uh, getting hr, h big theta, h, big phi, yeah. and of course that for every point here, for ev every position of the particle that I express in this coordinates, that there's a way to express it in, in those coordinates, right? So there's a way to map from this representation to this and vice versa. You can go in both directions. So what this means is that it's an isomorphism. 
which for purposes, think of it as a well-behaved function that is invertible and preserves nice properties like, um, like um, isomorphism, uh, sorry, like collinearity and so on, and multiplication by scalar. Okay, yeah, not that, not that it doesn't. Okay, but it's an invertible function, it's all behaved. So how do, we, how do we apply this? How do we transform the wave function that's expressed in this coordinate to a function that's expressed in those coordinates? Well, it's a generalization of something we did before. So let me move on. So what we did before, so say we have, we have a quantum state, right? It lives in 3D. And we saw before, well, we can expand it, for example, in the momentum basis, right? So this was integrating Px in Py in Pz. They all go from minus infinity to plus infinity. Here is my Px lives in x, Py lives in y, Pz and z and then what was here in the middle well this was the the momentum wave function of for this position in momentum right for px, PX, PX. Yeah. we did this and then we said well from the momentum representation we can go we apply the Fourier transform <coughs> and you can express this in the position basis right so we do dx dy dz and now we have here a function of x, y, z. Yeah. And again, this integrals all from minus infinity to plus infinity. So what was this? This was a, a local transformation. What was the transformation? It was the Fourier transform, right? In this case, I think the inverse one. And what do I mean by local? I mean inside each subsystem, right? So you can apply one transformation uh, just in, in X to go to PX to X. You can apply a transformation just in P and a transformation just in Z and you get them all together. So you don't change the subsystem structure. These, these are still the, the three subsystems, HX, HY, HZ. What we're going to do now is to apply a different type of transformation. We're going to apply a global transformation. Which is going to be our change of coordinates. To say, well, now I want an integral echelon R, theta, and phi. And I'm going to end up here with some wave function, put a tilde to distinguish from the others. That depends on R, theta, and phi. And the states are gonna live in different Hilbert spaces now. So I don't stay inside X, I go to R, big theta, big phi. And what are the integrals now? They go from zero to plus infinity for R, uh, pi, and two pi. Oh. Okay, so this is going to be our coordinate change. So, and again, the, the main difference is that from here to here, we respected the subsystem structure and from here to here, we're not going to respect it. Okay. And we'll see how this is done uh, once. Then in practice, it will turn out that it's very easy and we'll work just directly with the wave function. Then we can forget about uh, with all the subsystems that are underlying. Uh, should it be DPX, DP, yes, sorry, I forgot the this, yes, thank you. D, 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 thank you. Good. Uh, so what is this, what is this state, what is this thing that this, uh, subsystem decomposition that we're looking for. So we're gonna have 
HR, H, um, sorry, big theta, H, big phi. And what is this? So this is just the span of some little vectors R, which live from zero to plus infinity and so on. So this is the span of thetas living in this space, which go from zero to pi. And here, the same for, uh, so small phi, draw it like this, which live in big phi space. Zero to two pi. Yeah. <clears throat> so now what we need to do is just find what this global transformation is, right? And this is kind of our, our end goal is to find a wave function that lives in here. And I'll just tell you what the key idea is. So do you remember when we defined just in one dimension, we define this inner product, right? Between two points on the line, X and X prime. We say, well, this is just the Delta function between X and X prime, which means that if they're not the same, it's zero. And if they're same, it's this Delta function that gets rid of the integral and so on, right? So this really means <coughs> I have here X and I'm just asking if X prime is the same position or not, right? So we're gonna do the same. I'll just tell you now uh, the intuition and then I, I just tell you what we're hiding under the carpet, right? So we can define this in a product between a position in, sorry, this is the little phi, between a position in this coordinates and the position in the other coordinates. Which again is just asking, are these two the same points or are they not the same point? And we know when they are the same point, right? Because we said before, when we define the coordinates, oh, there it is. No, these are the conditions to being the same point. When X equals to this, when y equals to that, and when z equals to this, then we're talking about the same point in this coordinates or in this coordinates. So we'll do the same. And then I'll just tell you what I'm hiding here. So I just say, well, then this is the delta of what? X minus, X needs to be the same as R sine of theta cosine of phi to make sure we get the right X. But in addition, we also need that y is the same as r sine theta sine phi. And in addition, meaning multiplying z needs to be the same as r cosine of theta. Right. <coughs> so it's, it's kind of a, a generalization from this. Uh, this, uh, sorry, inner product to this. What I'm hiding here, what I'm making implicit is that of course we need to apply this, uh, these isomorphisms that we never say to like formally go from this factorization to that factorization, right? So this is kind of implicit. If you want to work on different factorizations of Hilbert spaces, we've got lots of projects on this in the group. Uh, <coughs> but for now, by the way, let me just say what you don't do and I'll write it in red. What you absolutely cannot do is try to compare, um, is try to compare R with X or try to compare theta with y or say 
with Z because these things live in different Hilbert spaces, right? This lives in the R Hilbert space, this lives in the X. They don't even have the same shape. Um, it lives in the Z, like this is not defined. But if you come here, well, this whole thing lives in the H3D up to an isomorphism, and this whole thing lives in the H3D. So we can do this. Okay? So this is meaningful, uh, and this here is not meaningful. Okay? So this we don't do. Okay, so now we just apply this to the wave function. And it's going to be a long way around to do this, to do a very simple thing. So. So again, what was the definition of the wave function? This was when you do this in a product. With your state that lives in 3D, right? I will not put, I will leave the subscripts implicit just so that I don't have to write them all the time, but uh, you know, to me. So it will be the same for this case for our spherical wave function. So we need to do this data check, right? Applied yeah, 3D with the isomorphisms implicit if we need them. But the thing is we can put here an identity for free. Yeah. And this identity acts on X, Y, Z, <coughs> which is again, Isomorphic to the to the global space. Right? So now we just expand this identity. So what we get? Uh, that's the advantage of not having the white blackboard. Copy this. We know what we have here. Dx, dy, dz. X, Y, Z. When you're studying, if it helps, really write all the Hilbert spaces explicitly. And now comes the. And these integrals, they all go from minus infinity to plus infinity. So. Okay. So now what we get? Dx dy, dz, and now we bring here inside our r theta thai, chuk, x, y, z, chuk, and then here what we have is the x, Y, Z, Chuk, and my state, which lives in 3D. Now it's very easy uh, because this is the wave function in Cartesian coordinates, right? And this is this inner product that we computed before. So this is this product of deltas of X minus R. Mm. Right, so it's these three things that we did just before. Uh, good, which means that we have these deltas for X, Y, and Z, which means that they cancel out, well, we get rid of the, of this uh, integrals. And then instead we just have this wave function evaluated for the positions where X is this, Y is that, and Z is the other one. So what went up is took of uh, R sine theta. Oh. Cosine of phi. R sine theta. 
sine phi and uh, cosine phi, where this is our x, y, z. I mean, we, we, we knew this intuitively from the beginning, right? That if you want the wave function at the position r theta two is just a matter of getting the original wave function in the x, y, z that correspond to this spherical coordinates. We're not doing, in a way it's simpler than this transformation to go to momentum because we, we, we don't apply anything strange to the function itself. We don't apply like the Fourier transform to the function itself or so on. We're really just changing uh, the way we express the coordinates, right? But now we saw how to do it um, decently. So we can forget about it. I'll just write down how we do it in the other direction. Um, yeah, we can go for a break of 15 minutes now. I'll write down in the meantime, the other direction, which is exactly the same. And then we continue with the angular momentum after the break. And here if you have questions.
Okay, let's restart. <clears throat> so as I was saying, to go in the other direction, to go from um, the wave function of, of R theta and phi to the wave function in terms of x, y, and z, uh, it's the same thing. So we just write this coordinate change um, in the other way. So it's the same equations, but now we just isolate different variables. These are the ones we're interested in. Uh, by the way, of course, R is the modulus of this vector x, y, z. So it's given by this. Um, here, when I have cos minus one is not the cosine and then everything, uh, it's not one over the cosine, it's the R cosine, right? So the inverse uh, function, same here for the tangent. To get the angles back, and then again, you can write this in the product, which is the same as the inner product with cats and brass swap because it's a real number uh, in terms of these deltas. Okay. And these deltas are the same altogether. They are the same as the conditions we saw before because um, you know they represent the same equations. They represent these three equations, just uh, these three system of equations just with isolating different variables. Right? So you do exactly the same procedure and we write you arrive to how to write the wave function x, y, z in terms of the wave function in spherical coordinates. Again, uh, it's the same wave function, right? It has the same value here and here. We're just changing how to express x, y, and z. That's good. But we were talking about angular momentum. So then let's go back to angular momentum. Back to angular momentum. So we had, for example, LZ, which we said was what? So this was uh, X, PY, and then Z minus Y, PX, I then it in Z. If there's too much noise in the background, let me know and I can close some doors. Um, Minus this, right? And I told you that it's it's going to be easier to find the the eigenstates of this in spherical coordinates than in Cartesian coordinates, right? But these operators here they're all in the in the Cartesian subsystems. So how do you transform it to spherical uh, to spherical coordinates? So we could try to transform like each operator, like this operator at the level of operators in Hilbert spaces directly, but this would be a mess. Right, because these Hilbert spaces, they're, they are different. I don't even know if there's an equivalent of X and P for the angles and so on. I've not tried to do it, but I suspect it's a mess. So what we do is to see how this LZ acts on the wave function, right? So what does LZ do to our usual wave function? Well, <clears throat> what do we know? We know that, for example, p x takes the wave function and gives i h bar no, minus i h bar d d x. Right? This we saw many many lectures ago. We also saw, for example, y takes the wave function and returns the value of y times the same wave function, right? So if we, if we put that together with, with LZ, then what we get is minus i h bar. Look, from here, we have p i, so we have d dy. And we also have x, so we get x back. And it doesn't matter if we have if you write the x before or after the y because they're independent. And minus y d dx. It's, that's this term here of the wave function x y z, right? And ideally, we we want to write that l z is going to act on my wave function now expressed in spherical coordinates. And it's gonna act in, in a certain way, right? 
which means that we need to take this these things here and write them in spherical coordinates. And the good news is that here, I'll just show you how we do it um, and you'll do it in a lecture. And the other good news is that we don't need to work with the Hilbert spaces. We're just working at the level of this function that depends on some variables. So <laughs> X, we know how to transform X directly to R, right? We say, well, X is R sine of theta cosine of phi, that's directly. But then we have to work to transform these deriv derivatives to some derivatives as functions of, of our spherical coordinates. And for this, uh, we use some ingredients from calculus. So one nice thing about physics is that, I mean, use whatever tools you have at hand, right? I mean, calculus was even developed to solve physics problems. <clears throat> so it, it's no surprise that you use some elements from linear algebra and some things from uh, group theory and now some things from calculus. So we have X that is, what is it? It's independent of, of Y and Z, but it depends on R, theta and, sin, and phi, right? On that way that we saw. So what's the chain rule for derivatives that you've all learned in calculus is that if we have, we want to do a derivative in order of X, well, what we do is just take off a sum of all the other variables, um, W. So these are the other variables of R of dW dx d, dW. In the case of x, even if you have all these other variables, it's independent of this two. So this thing is going to be zero for this two. So then we have only this left. So then this is going to be So they are, first we have uh, r dx dr plus theta dx dd theta plus d phi dx d d phi, right? And so we have to compute, uh, so go. So we have to compute these things, okay? Because the rest is good, it's already in terms of spherical coordinates, but now we have this, uh, and we have to express them in terms of the spherical coordinates only. So the, again, you'll do it in a lecture, I'll show here how we do the first one. So we're gonna do this one here very high level and you'll do all of them in the lecture, right? Then you need to do the same for d dy and then you need to do the same for d dz. Uh, you'll do it in a tutorial, not in a lecture. So for example, suppose we wanted to do the first one, so dr dx. Well, what was r? r we saw is the square root of x squared plus y squared plus z squared, right? So now we take this derivative. You'll do all the steps slowly at the tutorial, but this is just, uh, it's gonna be x over this thing. Okay. As you remember this from calculus or you trust me or you do it yourself, which is what you'll do in the tutorial, right? And now <clears throat> this is still no good because we want, we don't want to work with X, Y, and Z. We want to work only in terms of spherical coordinates. So we rewrite this. So X was what? Uh, we said X is R sine theta cosine chuck. In this thing down here, this is just R. 
So then overall, this is sine theta cosine chip. So then you do the same for uh, dd theta. Uh, sorry, the sorry, that's not it. You do the same for d theta dx, and you do the same for the phi dx, and some of them are nicer than others. <coughs> You'll do it all in the tutorial, and it will get complicated because before it gets simple, because at the end of the day, when you you find out that when you do this, minus y d the x, which is what we need for the angular momentum. There's like eight different terms and they all cancel each other. And at the end, it's very nice. It's just this. Huh. Meaning what? That in this case, we can write LZ as acting on the wave function. In our spherical coordinates, it just goes to, we said minus i h bar from before. And now this derivative in order of phi of this thing. So this is what you'll do explicitly in the tutorial. I hope I've given you the overview. So after doing it for LZ, you need to do it for LX, for LY. Then for plus and minus, uh, and then, and then for uh, L squared, right? And then this is what I was preparing before the lecture, so I did it already, so we don't have to go through it now. You get this. Huh? I don't like it either. This is where the maths led us. It's it's a bunch of uh, of derivatives. We will look into them into more detail when we need to later on. The only thing that's nice to look at now is that there's no R here. There's no derivatives uh, in order of R. Uh, yeah, anywhere actually. But it's everything to do with these two angles, theta phi, theta, theta phi, na 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 but there's no R anywhere. <coughs> so the exact form of this, it's something we compute once to see how it works, and then we'll just use them. But what was our goal? Our goal was to find these eigenstates of LZ, right? Why? Not just because we care, we can, but because, um, They are useful later. They, they're very useful because they'll correspond to the stationary states on simple molecules and hydrogen atoms and so on. Yeah. So again, what was the idea? That when you have LM, this is the equation for, for the eigenstate. And now we can write it already in spherical coordinates because we know uh, how it acts on the wave function. So LZ, if you remember, just takes the wave function to this nice thing here. Okay. So then we have minus I H bar derivative in order to phi of the wave function corresponding to this state, so LM. This is equal to HM. And now this wave function, so in spherical coordinates, let's not forget. Okay, now this is this is actually something that's tractable. So we just put all the constants on one side. And that gives us I M Okay, so 
for once, we got a differential equation that we know how to solve. So first derivative of function equals function times a, a complex constant, an imaginary constant. Okay, so we know how to solve this. And the solution is, of course, then Lm it's e to I am the variable that we're deriving to took times a constant and constant in what <coughs> constant on phi. We don't know anything about the other two variables for now. So it's going to be some kind of function that can still depend on L and on M, but it's a function just of R in theta, right? It has no more this uh, phi dependence. Okay. So this is one step. And now, of course, it does not give us a total wave function. We still need to find out more about this, this, this function that depends only on R and theta. And this is when we use the rest of all this spin machinery. <clears throat> so if you remember when we talked about how to find all the eigenstates of of LZ, we think, oh, we have this ladder of spins, right? And over here is the bottom. And then we go up in steps of one minus L plus one, chuka, chuka, chuka. And then over all this here, L plus L, right? And then we saw, well, we go up this ladder with L plus, and we go down with L minus, and if we apply L minus on the last stage, we should get zero, right? It's the same if we apply L plus um, on the top state, we should get zero again. So that's exactly what we're going to do. We will start at the bottom. We don't know the state of, of, of the bottom, but we know that it must be such that if we apply this operator, we get zero. It's exactly the same simple um, mechanism as for spin. It's just that the explicit form of the operator is a bit more annoying. Right? So what we know is that zero is L minus applied on this bottom state, right? Oh, sorry, minus L. So this is the value of M. Okay, so then we have to replace this L minus, now we're applying this to the wave function. So it's going to be something applied to the wave function L minus L of R theta and phi, right? And now we apply here the whole machinery that we, that we did. So if we go back to look for the expression for L minus, ah, here it is, right? it acts on the, on the wave function like this, okay? Okay, so now we, we simplify this. Well, zero equals, this is a constant that's not zero, so we can get rid of it for free. And then what do we have? Well, we have then let's do it explicitly. So we have zero equals d d theta minus i theta And then we can replace here already what we know about this function, right? So we know from before that this function has this form here. And we know the value of m is minus l. So we write it down here. So we have here e to uh, l phi, this is the value of m. And then this unknown thing, that depends on the r and theta. <coughs> okay. So now we try to simplify this a little bit better. So we have zero equals, let's do, First, this first derivative applied here. So it does nothing to this const 
lactam does not depend on theta. So we have E two minus I L that. And then we have the derivative of this F function, which depends on, on again on R and theta. Okay. Minus I Now this derivative on phi it does nothing to this because this depends only on R and theta, does not depend on phi. So that's a constant. L minus L of R took. And now we have the, the derivative of this thing. So that's minus I L, E minus I L, joke. Okay, good. Okay, so we look at this. Yeah, it's like accounting. Um, we have this constant here that's not zero and here. So it's like a constant times the whole thing because we have zero on the other side, we can get rid of it. Okay, good. So now we can, um, this minus I cancels with this I. And then we just move, we just move the derivative to the other side. So then we have tick of our function equals uh, L cotangent of took cotangent is the cosine over the sine, and then the function again. There's no physical insight here so far. We're really just solving this, simplifying this equation as much as we can, and we got there. This is as simple as it's going to get. So we have the derivative on one side, and then here we have the function again, times a constant, times this cotangent of, of theta, right? If you like calculus a lot, you have the tools to solve this. Otherwise, you plug this into a computer and it gives you the solution of this equation, right? So <clears throat> turns out the solution is of this form. Tell it. Uh, so f of r and theta. So first of all, note that there's no there's no dependence on, on r anywhere in this differential equation, right? So it will be a constant that is allowed to depend on r, <coughs> and then the part that depends on theta turns out to be sine to the l of theta sine to the power of L of theta, uh, you can take the derivative and see that it works. Okay? And, and verify that it is a solution if you want. <coughs> so uh, this one, we're gonna leave it alone for now. Later on, when we talk about specific Hamiltonians, we'll, we'll, we'll look into more detail about what this is. But for now, it could be anything. So overall, what we have, So we have this, we were looking for this wave function for minus L, theta and phi. <coughs> so we have this unknown function, and then we have sine L of theta, and then we have the part we had before, E to minus I L. Good. This thing, by the way, it has a name. They call this spherical harmonics. I'll talk about them a little bit uh, in a few minutes. Hmm. 
So it turns out these kind of functions uh, like this, they pop up in other fields of mathematics on every other spherical symmetry and you solve some differential equation. And we end up with this kind of things. <coughs> okay, so now we have the explicit form up to this function of R of the lower state in the ladder, right? So how do we find all the other states here? Now we need, we have the form of this, we apply L plus and get the next one, apply L plus and get the next one and so on, right? So, uh, the other two, um, M. We just apply L plus many times because if you remember from when we talked about spin, when we apply L plus to an eigenstate of, of um, LZ, you get the next eigenstate up to a normalization constant. And this turned out to be this thing, right? So L, L plus one minus M. Right? We could have done it the other way around. So we could have started at the top, applied L plus, and now go down the ladder. It's equivalent. So um, we will not do this explicitly, right? Because as you've seen so far, these are pretty horrible equations to solve. And like, as long as you know how you do it or how you tell a computer to solve it, uh, I'm happy, right? That's all the physical insight you need for now. But we can look at some properties. So one is that uh, L plus does not depend on R that we saw before. Which means what? R of R, this this function here will not change when we go up and up and down the ladder. So it cannot depend on M. It can only depend on, on L. Okay, so it does not depend on M. <coughs> um, the other thing is that it acts, and I'll write here nicely. You'll do it explicitly in the tutorial on this coordinate phi. And is more annoying uh, for theta. So it's, let's not call it annoying, let's call it complex. <laughs> and theta. But what we do with this is that we, we are able to split. You know, if you do this explicitly, we get here the wave function for Lm, and then here you get all this differential operator, and you kind of split it into a part that acts only on, on theta and the part that acts only on, on phi. And this makes things a bit easier to solve. So overall, what we get is this, that our Lm, So it's going to be some R that depends on your L R. Then we add the what is called the spherical harmonics, right? And we can further split the spherical harmonics R of L into two parts, into a part that depends on only on on phi, which is very simple, it's just this exponential. And then the part that depends on theta, okay, which is a bit more complex. And this, this people here, they call the Legendre polynomials. But we know how to do it, right? We apply this operator, we get a differential equation, we simplify it, 
and we get this. So this is called the spherical harmonics in case you see this somewhere else. And these are little polynomials that pop up in other situations as well. So how do we get, what is the simplified equation to get the Legendre polynomials? Well, <clears throat> so to get, so it's the same. So we start from the bottom. So we have P of L minus L of theta. This is exactly what we saw before, sine L of theta. <clears throat> and because we need a normalization constant for the whole wave function, we put it inside here. Uh, the reason for that is that it only depends on L for now. So there's some function here that just normalizes the whole thing so that, for example, um, this thing can be normalized. So I'm still debating whether to have you proved this explicit in the tutorial or just have you believe me. But don't worry, I will, I will not ask you to do this in the exam. So this is the normalization constant. And then we just go up the ladder from here and we just get a simpler equation, uh, differential equation than we saw before. So we go. Uh, we we'll go up the ladder. So we know what happens M as an effect here, but also as an effect here. So P of L, M plus one of theta. It's gonna be some normalization constant, which we saw before, L, L plus one minus M, M plus one. And then a bunch of things that depend only on theta. So P of M of theta minus M. Okay, I'm not proving this. I'm just, I'm just telling you uh, what they are. I think, yeah, maybe I'll, I'll put an exercise in the tutorial to prove this just so that you see it explicitly once. I will not ask this in the exam. <coughs> um, again, like, you know, these functions here, it only depends on, on L, it depends on M, and it depends on theta. And just like for adding spins, they've all been computed. Okay. It's, it's gonna be rare if you find, if you have a simple system that you need to, to solve this differential equation from scratch because they, they have been solved before. They are very useful, so they're very famous differential equations. So then we can just consult with them. And so just to give you an example, so now I'll give you an example. We, we leave this alone for now, and I'll just give you some examples of this. So it will turn out, and I will not explain now for now. Um, remember when we talk about spins, we said it could be integer or half integer. So it turns out angular momentum is integer. So L can be zero, one, two, or so on. I've not proven this yet. I don't know if we'll prove it explicitly here. So then what's the simplest case is, well, L equals zero and M equals zero. But in this case, it turns out that the spherical harmonic is just one of a square root of four pi. So it's constant, okay, meaning that, so, my problem is spherical symmetry, right? So here's the center, for example, here's the center of an atom. <coughs> and, the, and the wave function will depend on R only. But for any point on R, then it will be constant over, over this kind of spherical surface. Right, so this should be constant. Maybe I can make it. So for every value of R, it's gonna be constant. <coughs> Sorry, for a fixed value of R, it's constant over all uh, theta and phi. That's why it's easier to write in these coordinates. So the next simple case is when the total angular momentum is one, 
but all this angular momentum is in the x and y directions, there's zero in the z direction, right? So then x one zero, this is tri over four pi, and then cosine of theta, which means again, if I look at my, <coughs> at my function for a fixed r, then it's gonna be kind of, the eigenstate's gonna be um, more concentrated around the, the poles. And when we get to here, to the xy plane, it's gonna be zero, right? So this is a terrible drawing, but you can imagine it being the wave function being very big here, and then it decreases with, with the angle. Again, this is easy to write in spherical coordinates. It will be very hard to write in, in Cartesian coordinates. And then the next case is, is one. And now the total angular momentum is one and it's all in the z direction, right? So then one, oh, one, uh, plus one. Then uh, it's minus time. Mm -hmm. yeah. And if um, so, this is plus one. And if it's minus one, then you just get some different signs there. <coughs> so now this is, what is this? Let me try to draw it. So now it's kind of, yeah, it's heavier on the X, Y plane. It, it decreases as you go up. And in addition, it has a phase that depends on where in the x, y plane you are. But, <clears throat> so it looks a bit more like this. Uh, there are better drawings of these things than I can, than I make now. Okay. So what is, what's the takeaway message so far? One is that it's doable. The second is that the differential equations start getting a bit annoying, but you know, it's nothing conceptually new. We just have to get through it. The other thing is that we can change uh, coordinate system. And even though what's going under the hood is a bit subtle, then when we, when we apply it to just the wave function, then it's very direct, it's exactly the same as in the classical case, right? In this case. Uh, good. And now we just got to the point where you computed all the, the eigenstates of LZ. We know it will have some radial component. This will depend now later on what Hamiltonian we have. So now in the next lecture, I will look uh, <coughs> So in the next lecture, we're gonna look at some Hamiltonian that's gonna be P squared over two mass plus some potential that now depends only on R. So meaning that it's, it's what is called a central potential. So for example, if you have an electrical force then it's gonna be the charge, if you have an electrical force between two particles, it's gonna be the charge of two, of the two particles times some constant divided by uh, some function of R. I think it's just uh, okay. And this is going to be the case exactly for the hydrogen atom. Then we're going to see that AHL squared is zero. For this, we're going to need this horrible form of L squared. And then from here, <coughs> we're going to find the stationary states of this Hamiltonian, which will turn out to be the eigenstates of LZ, right? That's why we've computed them here. Hmm? And this is as hard, I mean, this is as far as one can get in quantum mechanics to solve actual physical systems like atoms. 
uh, without having to use numerics. Right. So to do analytical solutions, uh, this is as kind of as far as one goes. So now we'll continue this. In the next lecture, we will just dispatch the hydrogen atom. And then we still have a week or two to talk about more fun things like how we quantify uncertainty from the uncertainty principle to density matrices and so on. So that's my plan for the next uh, few lectures. If you have questions, I'm here. Otherwise, see you on Thursday at the usual time, hopefully. Oh, and I will upload the lecture notes as soon as I'm back in the office. Right, I have them here, but we've not been in. Yeah, thanks, see you.